You're watching Heart to Heart on ABC 27. Brought to you by Penn State Hilton S. Hershey Medical Center. A Dolphin County man felt, felt faint and had shortness of breath, but didn't think too much about it. After the third episode, Bob Newhouse knew something was very wrong. This is Bob Newhouse's pride and joy, a 1936 Ford. As a retired auto body mechanic, he knew exactly how to replace the brakes, transmission, and rebuild the engine. It's just a, an enjoyment to take something and make something better, yeah, and to see a finished product. A lot of work to get this beauty up to speed so he can hit the road. Bob almost didn't see this dream come true. Last September, he and his wife Marion were at the beach, and that's when the problem started. Bob went to get some juice out of the refrigerator, and he said he was dizzy. And I got lightheaded, and I almost fainted. And I said to my wife, I gotta sit down. I said, and I was really breathing heavy. Bob passed it off, but the same symptoms returned the following day. Thursday night when I carried the suitcases in, that's when I really minded it, you know, how to sit downstairs. And I didn't let her know that I was down there because of shortness of breath, you know, and uh, I thought, well, things will work out. But things did not work out. The next day, Bob and Marion went to have lunch with friends, but never made the lunch date. Friday, when we went down to Traditions, when uh, he dropped me off at the door and he parked the car, when he came back across the parking lot, he started with the labored breathing again, and this time it was extensive. I was breathing so heavy, I had to sit down, I was lightheaded, and I says, everything's gray, like, you know, my vision turned gray, and she says, this isn't good. <sighs> like he was gasping for his last breath. And it was continuous for that minute and a half, maybe even longer. I was breathing that heavy that she was on the phone with 911. And they said, get him to the hospital. She, in fact, we'll send an ambulance. It scared me. It takes a lot to scare me. A couple minutes later, the ambulance arrived. Then they took me to the Medica Center. Then they did an ultrasound on my legs. And uh, when they did that, they found blood clots. His problem uh, was what we call pulmonary embolus, where blood clots that had formed in the legs had migrated into the lungs and were blocking blood from getting to the lungs and therefore going through the lungs and picking up oxygen and then being pumped to the rest of the body. People that have uh, massive pulmonary emboli like this um, have a very, very low survival rate actually treated uh, medically. Dr. Walter Pay didn't waste any time to get Bob into the OR. The prayers that went up. I mean, I was told there was over 20 some people in the wait room. So, that made me feel good. You know, people care. And that's, that's amazing. Friends, family, in-laws, we even had second generations, nephews, nieces. The Bob is so loved. He is just so loved. So much concern. They anxiously waited for some news. When the operation was over, it didn't take the full two hours. It only took like an hour and a half. And Dr. Pei called me and my daughter in, and he said, I want you two to come with me. And I thought, oh, he didn't make it, or he'd be telling everybody. And what he wanted was to show me on the computer the size of these blood clots that he took out of Bob. What we're looking at is the actual blood clots that were retrieved uh, from, from the patient's lungs. And what you'll notice is, is these blood clots look like strands. And they are strands. They mimic the actual veins in the legs that the clots uh, uh, came from. Couldn't believe the blood clots. I never thought they were look like that. <laughs> I always thought blood clots were just little balls and stuff. If they are very, very large like his, uh, it can be fatal more often than not. Bob was reminded of that a day after the surgery. Wednesday morning, 
uh, one of the doctors come in and he says, hey, thanks for making us heroes. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he says, uh, you're only the 20th person in the last five years to survive that operation. I said, well, you guys are the ones that operated. I said, I, I can only say that you know, I was at the right place at the right time and the good Lord had a hand in it. But the look at him, you'd never know. He's been through all that in just a short period of time. We count our blessings. And as you can see, Bob is doing great. As for his pride and joy, the 1936 Ford, well, you may see him driving it around next month. Back to you, Chuck. Thank you, Deborah. I think so. Route 66, maybe, something like that. Looks great. So joining us now is Dr. Michael Lazar, a cardiothoracic surgeon. And we were talking during, while we were looking at that tape, and it's, uh, cases like this, are patients like Bob, are they at risk this happening again? Oh, they sure are. Um, the same conditions exist in his body that cause the clots in the first place. Taking out this clot doesn't take those conditions away. So all these patients get a filter placed into them, something that prevents new fatal blood clots from making it into their lungs. And when the underlying condition goes away, those filters can get taken out. Now, how do these clots form? Is this something that happens like that, or does it take a while? No, uh, it can happen right away. Uh, the big risk factors are stasis, where uh, the blood doesn't flow very well in the long, in the, uh, through the legs. Things like operations and long car rides, all that sort of stuff can do it. And then there needs to be something else that contributes, a hypercoagulable state where your blood is likely to clot. And that could happen from cancer or smoking or birth control pills. Lots of things can lead to that. It's a little frightening, but what can people do at home now to prevent these kind of clots? Um, a lot of things you can't avoid. You can't avoid surgery, and if you have a diagnosis like cancer, you can't fix that. But there's things like smoking that can be stopped and birth control pills and even long trips where you're, you're in a plane and you're partially dehydrated. Just getting up and walking around every 15 or 20 minutes to, to flex the muscles in your legs and keep the blood flowing makes a big difference. It's a catch-22 because people don't like to drink a whole lot on a long flight because making that little trip to the back of the plane all the time. And you might cheat and then you pay for it later. It's true. It's a, it's a horrible combination of things. The dehydration makes your blood likely to clot and sitting still stops the blood flow in your lung, in your legs and that that can lead to these blood clots. Now what about a patient in the hospital? What's done there to prevent clots? Uh, two big things. Uh, during surgery, the blood flow is very poor at the induction of anesthesia. So at the start of every operation that we do, patients get both heparin, a blood thinner, and mechanical prophylaxis, squeezers on the legs to keep the blood flow going well. And then every patient in the hospital now is treated with prophylaxis. And so the computerized order entry systems make it so that you really have to think why someone shouldn't get blood thinners rather than why they should. Is there any group of people that's uh, higher risk of clots than someone else? Sure. Um, smokers, people with inflammatory diseases like cancer, um, people who've had recent surgery, um, uh, morbidly obese folks, uh, people on birth control pills, all these folks are at higher risk. And anyone immobilized, anyone laying around in bed, not walking around like normal. Stay active. Keep moving around. Absolutely. Well, Doctor, thank you for joining us in here tonight. And let's check back with Deborah in the call center to see what kind of calls we're getting in there. Deborah? I'll, check, I'll tell you what, these guys are certainly very busy. The phone lines are still ringing. Continue to call the new number, 236-1444. And here's Dr. Davis to answer another viewer question for us. This is the question. When I was 37, I was diagnosed with bilateral pulmonary embolisms. Seven years later, I continued to take Coumadin daily and have my blood pressure and cholesterol checked. I exercise four times a week and I have a healthy diet. Is there anything else I can do as a preventative measure? Is it possible to get off of the medication? Well, it sounds like uh, he's doing all the right things. Uh, the only thing I would add is to be sure that he continues to have very close follow-up with his physician. Most patients who have pulmonary emboli have a reason for it. If, the, if we can get rid of that reason, they can come off of the Coumadin. But if we can't get rid of that reason, they, they may need to be on it for a long time. Okay, great. Thank you. And we'll check back with you in just a few minutes with more viewer questions.